so tonight's program, uh, Mr. Berlin Jose, uh, he's a member of the Tahana Optum Nation. Um, Mr. Jose is a traditional leader, practitioner, and has served as the Tana Adam Nation's Legislative Council Chairman and as a nation's Vice Chairman. As such, he has attempted to explain to the federal government how important the continuity of Tana Adam's sacred and religious traditions are, not only to his people, but also for the health and wellness or the well-being of the land itself. Mr. Jose has written, I learned, quote, I learned that we had have a basic human responsibility to protect the land and the people. We <clears throat> must continue <clears throat> and religious practices to keep the world in balance, end quote. So please welcome um, our guest speaker, um, Verlin Jose. But before we get to hear from Verlin, he, uh, provided us with an amazing uh, short video. So we will go ahead and start that. It is called Healing the Border. Today, the borderlands are literally built out. More than 700 miles of sensitive ecosystems have been carved out and destroyed to make room for a border wall. But for thousands of years, long before the foundation of the two neighboring nation states, these borderlands have been home to indigenous communities who know no boundaries. Only their lands and their traditions that bind them to the land and to each other. And now at a time when everyone else seems to have an opinion on what should happen at the border, we want you to listen to our voices. Eh, el territorio de, 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 los, de, de Lotan llega hasta de, más o menos del río Salado, porque es Casa Grande, toda esa parte antes de llegar a Phoenix hasta Hermosillo, es el territorio OTAN. Bueno, es la nación más grande que hay ahorita y que ha existido por miles y miles de años y que fue la única que no, no se rindió ante todo lo, lo que estaba pasando cuando, cuando se hicieron, vinieron y colonizaron todos los españoles, ya después llegaron los gringos y gracias a Dios eh, me siento honrado de, de ser descendiente del activo Tojono OTAN. What we're doing is we're doing these interviews because we believe that the testimonies and the stories of the lived experience of the peoples are so important in the preservation and the protection of our treasured cultural and spiritual reserves. <laughs> My Machiki here, just about my got out of life and I'm just a woman that cook you, cook you, chunky, you go, 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 the ma hooky. Good morning. My name is Lorraine Marcus Eiler. I live in Ajo, Arizona, and I'm going to be talking about my, my relatives, the people that I descend from who are here to talk them and who used to live at Kido Vaquito Springs. We are tribal and faith-based communities who stand united 
in our concern, grief, outrage about the border wall. We believe the destruction of still living place-based spiritual practices at or near the border is a moral assault on the sanctity of all of our cultural and spiritual practices. A direct assault on all life. The border wall has disrupted our religious expressions, damaged our sacred sites, destroyed ceremonial plants, and threatened our sacramental waters. In Arizona and California, the autumn and the Kumeye have seen their sacred springs depleted and dried up. Seasonal floods now threaten autumn communities living near dams and arroyos in Sonora, Mexico. In the past year, burial sites, artifacts have been bulldozed by government contractors, even though their sensitive locations were fully provided to officials for months in advance. Along the Arizona border, we witness how Quito Springs, whose waters have been used ceremonially for millennia, have been seriously damaged from border wall construction and water pumping by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security and the Armored Corps of Engineers. Quito Springs is the only source of water for humans endangered wildlife and rare oasis plants for 20 miles in any direction. During the wall construction, more than 84,000 gallons of water was withdrawn each day from the aquifers of the desert wilderness to mix concrete for the wall. At Quito Bequito Springs, the water level dropped more than three feet. We call for restoration and mitigation of all of the damaged springs and waterways that are critical to our native cultures and to wildlife. In California, the Kumeye have seen their sacred Hakumba Springs dry up. <laughs> Some of these areas, we wouldn't be disturbing anyway because of their sacredness. We wouldn't go there unless we were prepared ourselves and asked for permission from the Creator. But these people, they just go there and destroy things, they move things out of the way, they uproot important plants. And, and they have affected the waterways, and it's just heartbreaking. We call for the removal of segments of the wall that have interfered with the flow of water, animal migration, pilgrimage trails, and trade between nations. We want to see an end to groundwater extraction and artificial lighting in wildlife refuges and other sensitive areas. We urge our governments to reinvest in restoring key cultural ecological areas and habitats, including replanting saguaros in destroyed areas. Pues el muro, yo digo que, que no debe de estar en las reservas. Le digo por qué? Porque afectaría a todas las las tradiciones de nosotros, las ceremonias, porque son sitios sagrados, porque oiga, hay, haz de cuenta que, que nosotros vamos a sentir que nos están partiendo el corazón, porque porque pues son son tierras que defendemos de hace muchos años. Antes hacía fiesta ahí en San Francisquito, las ceremonias de todo, ahora no 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 se hace nada, no se puede hacer nada. The border wall has also blocked our pilgrimages and our ability to practice our sacred saguaro ceremony, seasonal ceremonies, and celebrations with our families. The border wall has disrupted relationships between our communities. Sacred salt pilgrimages of the Akamira Autumn, Dawn Autumn, 
hefted out them that crisscrossed the border, including Quito Bukito, are being blocked by the border wall, causing this sacred journey to seize on its traditional route that has been for millennia. The pilgrimage is key rite of passage for young men, and salt harvested from the Sea of Cortez is used in healing ceremonies. No se están recorriendo lo que es los senderos originales. ¿Por qué? Porque están bloqueando eh, eh, con el muro. Y la verdad, pues, me siento yo muy triste, enojado. Me duele mucho porque eh, es algo que mis ancestros eh, lo pelearon pues, para que estuviera que tra generación tras generación. Don Autumn families live in on both sides of the border grieved the loss of content and relationships between their families because of the wall. Era muy importante y es importante, por ejemplo, el, el, el día de San Francisquito, eso, un mes antes empezábamos a carrear leña, a carrear agua porque se carreaba agua. O sea, todo por esa, porque nosotros creíamos en eso. Yo no conozco otros, y ahora con el muro va a ser mucho menos, o sea, que va a parar nuestra cultura, va a parar nuestro con nuestros hijos, o sea, ya, ya eso ya no, ya no va a poder ser, ya no le vamos a enseñar a nosotros, a nuestros hijos, ni tampoco ir y venir por la cuestión de San Francisquito. San Francisquito es algo, está una capilla y, o sea, hay, hay muchas cosas que eran de nosotros y ya se nos quitó por qué, porque quieren un muro, o sea, ¿quién quiere el muro? Es gente que no es de allí. No pueden ellos opinar, yo digo, no deberían de opinar porque no es tierra de ellos. I feel like they don't recognize us as a present people. We're either something in a history book that's really fascinating or we're some kind of like, I don't like some kind of like pedestal little like, oh, this is a pretty Indian, look at them, like, you know, kind of thing, but we don't have actual meaning to them. And as we witness how current border wall construction has continues to violate tribes' religious freedoms, we are calling for justice. We are proposing solutions, not just legitimate grievances. Yeah. Ida is Haichuaga. These are our stories. Let's
Не, худенек, вот с этим мы, Ани Тюгек, Брилан Хосе, и Амде, Аме Муага Кук, в Агаске, Теколоти, Тюкутколока Тюкшин. Помочь, Ида. Худник, мы дом. Я аг, а че агас? Ну ида мо агас. Ида пастюкшем. Ида мо агас это делает. Good evening to each and every one of you. I want to thank the Creator for giving us this day, for giving us this time. The land, the water, the air, the animals, the plants, and each other. Given us this time that we're able to come together in this technological means to share information, to share our stories to share our videos, to share our words. I want to thank the host and the team at Southwest Archive for inviting me to be here um, this evening. I think it's been about a year in the making, <laughs> I think. <laughs> I'm very excited um, to be here. And at the time when At the time when it was first asked, uh, the narrative was a little bit different. Um, and the reason why I felt it was important to show the video is because that video says a lot in itself. And that is the tip of the iceberg of many discussion. And the subject matter of that was no No war, no more war. But even though that there may have been some thoughts that the wall stopped, today, today there still is some activity in terms of continuing to enclose that line they call the international borderline. I am Berlin Jose. I, I am a member of the Stone Auto Nation. I live here in Seoul. I live in Sadek Sonora. I live on the road. I live wherever the creator takes me. <laughs> I'm not confined to a box or, where, or wherever my guests will get me to. <laughs> wherever there's work to be done. Because we weren't meant to be confined to reservations. We weren't meant to be confined to countries. We weren't meant to be confined to states. We weren't meant to be confined at all. The creator had placed us here on this earth to live freely, to live in harmony with each other and mother nature. And so I want to share a little bit of information. I, I do not have any degrees. I do not profess to be the most knowledgeable in this, but I'll tell you from how I know it, from what was told to me or what I learned on my own. As I shared one time at Princeton University, I'm a freshman at the University of Life. <laughs> Still have a lot to learn. 
Oh, I do want to make a correction. I do want to make a correction that uh, in one, I saw one, and maybe they changed it. The information about Berlin Jose, it says he's an elder of the nation or something like that. I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> I still claim I'm 21 years of age. Or maybe I just act like that, but uh, my body tells me different. Um, I have not reached elder status. I'm knocking on the door. Uh, but a lot of things that I know I've learned uh, through oral uh, traditions and sharing. Um, since I was a child till today, and also educating myself. I have gone to college, some college, um, and then my life experiences as well. But the wealth of my knowledge, I credit to people sharing, whether that was my grandfather, my father, my mother, my aunts, uncles, family, and just elders in general. Um, so I'm going to share with you what I know, how I know it. And maybe you'll maybe you'll differ with me, you or maybe you've heard it different, and that's okay. I'm going to tell you how I know it. I'm going to share with you how I know it. And as I always said, and I shared this earlier, and one of my grandfathers said to me, "You need to tell your story. We need to tell our story. If not." Others are going to tell it for us. Others are going to write our story for us. And they're going to tell it the way they want to tell it. Yeah, so tonight, I'm going to tell it to you like how I know it. And we don't have four days um, to, to speak like they did in the old days where we would sit around the fire and talk. All night long. This is the time, the winter time is the time when we attend colleges and universities in a traditional sense. This is the time where we sit around those campfires and learn from our elders, learn from one another, where words weren't spoken, um, but we were taught to listen and only allowed the elder to speak, only allowed the speaker to speak and we were taught to listen. Um, that was back in the good old days when people listened. Now, I don't know if we do much of that anymore. <laughs> um, so in the beginning of time, don't worry, I'm gonna fast forward a lot of parts. So <laughs> um, when this world was created, there's a reason for everything. There's a reason for everything. There's uh, every stick and stone is, is sacred. And that's how we're taught. That's how we're taught to do and to live life. The air that we breathe, the rain that comes, the sun that comes, the wind that blows, the animals, the four-legged, the winged animals, the ones that call on their belly, from the smallest creature to the largest. We're taught to respect those things. We're, we're taught to live by the season. We're taught to live by where the resources are. As I mentioned, there are no boundaries. There is no wall. There's not even a word for wall in our language because there was never meant to be. And so traditionally, Historically, anthropologically, archaeologically, you can find the evidence of our people. From Hermosillo, Sonora to the south, to Phoenix, Arizona in the north, and from the San Pedro River to the east, to the Rio Colorado and the Sea of Cortez to the west was the footprint of the autumn. Tohono autumn. Tohono. Tohono is 
desert, autumn, as people, we are the Tohono Autumn. We are the desert people. We are people of the desert. They called us the Papagos. We were the Papago tribe in the 1930s, 35, 36, 37, when we were created by the US federal government. We were the Papago tribe of Arizona. We changed it in 1986 to the Thorn Nation because Papago was a name that was put upon us. And they still call us that today in Mexico, the Papagos. We are also changing that in Mexico as well too, to the Tohono O'odham. We were placed here by our creators. We were taught to, to protect the land protect the land and to protect the people and to protect the resources and to be conservative of those things. We didn't take with greed, we didn't take with the resources of mother nature, nor did we abuse the, the creatures of mother nature. We lived off the land, we, we lived off the animals, we lived off the water, the natural encatchments, hand dug wells, and we lived by the season. And so when, when we were created and we were given this at some point, we, we as people uh, were not living in harmony anymore. And the creator took it all away from us. The creator took it all away from us. Uh, and some of us he took. And he took us underground. And he destroyed everything else that was here. And then the creator that brought us back from underground, he led us from underground, our elder brother, Ethoi had brought us up from the underground world and told us, okay, this is where you're gonna call home. You guys, I'm gonna, you guys are gonna go over there and you guys are gonna call home over there. You guys are gonna go over there and you're gonna call home over there. And those people that weren't maybe, were maybe a little bit of rough around the edges, he threw them on the other side of the waters. <laughs> and because um, they didn't quite grasp what he was trying to teach them and what he was trying to give them. So I think to this day, they're still fighting amongst each other. So as we lived here on the Tohono, on the, they call the Southwest Desert. This is not the Sahara Desert. Don't come here looking for sand. This is the Sonoran Desert. There are many sacred sites throughout this region that I talked about, throughout this geographical area that I talked about. From the mountain tops to the valley lows, in between, around, no matter where you look, you will run into archeological sites you will run into evidence of our people. They call a period of our time, a time during the, they call it hohogum. I understand it was supposed to be hohogum. Hohogum, hohogum, those that are gone, those that are no more. And they say that, I don't know, maybe some of you know it, maybe they say that they talk about this period of time where the people disappear. They're, they don't know what happened to them. They disappear. Then they call them the hogum. Hook, gone, no more. And an elder once told me, he said, they're not hogum. 
they're still here because I am here. I am a descendant of those people. So the hukum are not hukum, they're not gone, they're still here. And the evidence is us. But anyway, we'll leave that to the, the scholars to, to debate that one. But we are still here since time immemorial. And so my grandfather once told me, he said, you know, we don't respect the land anymore. We don't respect the land and the things that we're doing to Mother Nature, we're destroying, we're killing her. When we go and we build something and we stab the Mother Earth, we never ask for permission. We never ask for forgiveness. Would you go and would you get something and stab your mother in the belly? Because that's what we do when we start to create things. We start to build things. The Mother Earth. One of the reasons why the Tohonotu and, and, and most indigenous people or tribes are always asking for permissions through blessings. You're going to build a building, you do a blessing. You're going to dig a, make a fence, you do a blessing. And we pray in the morning, we give thanks, we pray at breakfast, we pray in between, we pray at lunch, we pray in the afternoon, we pray in the evening, we pray when we go to sleep because we give thanks. And yes, I'm that one that they asked me to say a prayer for our, our lunch one time. And this small boy looked at my son and he said, is that that man that sure prays for a long time? <laughs> he said, probably. <laughs> um, because we got to give thanks. We got to give acknowledgments before we partake. And that's who we are and that's how we survived all this time. And so when we do things, we just don't do things without regard and we've been telling our story and people have been writing about our story for many, many years. And no, we didn't cross the Bering Strait. I'll tell you that, I'll tell you that right now. So some have said that we've come from the Bering Strait. That is a folk tale. Whoever taught you that, taught you that wrong. Oh, and I want to say, I mean no disrespect to anyone as well. <laughs> I don't mean to disrespect you uh, by saying what I'm saying. I'm just saying it because what I know. <laughs> um, but in any event, it, it's what I'm trying to get here is that everything is very sacred. We're very humble people. We're very uh, trained, thankful people. In the first European context, we... We opened our arms, we opened our doors. We, and not only the Tohono O'odham, indigenous people have done that from the East Coast to the West Coast, from sea to shining sea, we opened our doors only to be robbed blindly in front of us. And upon European contact, autumn, we accept it people that came to this area. We accept it. Foreigners, I guess you would call them. We never asked them to see their passport or their visa card when they came. We said, come in, sit down. Well, we didn't have any houses back then. So um, our grandmother has always told us when someone comes, she invite them in. And she would always go and start cooking right away. You always start cooking and tell people to sit down and eat something. And she always said, offer, some, offer them something to eat. And if you didn't have any food, offer them something to drink. And if you didn't have any water, because at those times people went to the well to get water, offer them a place to rest. And that's what we did. And that's what 
We still do. Well, I don't know. We still do that too much today because if I go and knock on somebody's door, they look through that little hole in the door and say, oh, don't open the door. That's Berlin Jose. <laughs> or they open the door a little, a little bit and say, yes, what do you want? <laughs> um, but in any event, so in terms of this discussion and where I'm getting at, is that a lot of things happen. Fast forward. You know, I will tell you that the Stone Autumn, Stone Autumn affirm our sovereign powers of self-government. Not by a federally recognized tribe. We were sovereign before anyone even told us we were sovereign. We were sovereign before that, before we even knew what the word sovereign was. Because we affirmed our sovereign powers of self-government to protect, to preserve, and to build upon our unique and distinctive culture <clears throat> and traditions, to conserve our common resources, to establish a responsive form of government, to provide for the free expression of our people and to promote the rights, education, and welfare of the present and future generations. And that is the preamble of our constitution of the Donald Nation. But that also is within the teachings, our traditional teachings. So a lot of things happened in the past. And 1848, something happened. Uh, if I was in the classroom, I'd say, does anybody know? Raise your hand. I'm not gonna ask you to do that now. There was something called the Treaty of Peace, Friendship, Limits and Settlement between the United States of America and Mexico, the Mexican Republic, also known as the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo that put the international border right around where the Hill River is, somewhere around that area. I won't get too much into the, the discussion on that, but we could have a whole, another two hours of discussion on that. But the US paid $50 million. And then in 1853, um, something else happened. You got some purchase. $10 million federal government bought from Mexico and put the borderline right where it is today, as we speak. Not once ever consulting with the people that live here. And I've always asked people, why were we never consulted? Because we didn't matter. We were indigenous people. We were, we were nomads. We were you know, we, we didn't even, we weren't even recognized as human beings. We were recognized as heathen natives. We were recognized as, you know, they wanted to kill the Indian, save the man. Um, but the reason why they, they bought it is because, I don't know, from what I'm told, again, uh, don't, uh, you can fact check this if you want, <laughs> but, you know, a lot of people that were going west, uh, going looking for gold, um, California, the new frontier, uh, were going over the Colorado Rockies, and uh, the harsh winters were uh, taking a lot of lives of settlers that were going. And they sent an expedition to go look for another route. And they came around and they said, hey, we found it's a little bit longer, but uh, it's very dangerous. It's not uh, U.S. territories and so forth. Um, anyway, you'll probably learn this in, if you hadn't already learned it in one of your history classes. But anyway, they bought the, the guests and purchase and cut our homelands in half. Therefore, you're gonna find archeological uh, um, areas, cultural, sacred sites 
of the Stone Autumn on both sides of the U.S. and Mexican border. In the U.S., um, there are laws that supposedly protect some of these things. But there are a lot of laws that are not enforced. There are a lot of laws that were waived by the government, including some 30 environmental laws in order for the border to be um, protected. Um, and the border wall just didn't, uh, just didn't start recently. They started to build that in, in in, in the 90s, in 1990, um, well, actually was the first physical barrier that was put up in, uh, in San Diego. 1994, somewhere around there, they, they did uh, Operation Gatekeeper, uh, increased overall manpower to the borders and created a whole, whole mess of things anyway, um, trying to secure the border. A lot of things happen, and I'm kind of fast forwarding uh, because sick of time and, and your consideration, and I want to leave it open for questions. But what happened, not only on the border and throughout tribal lands and, and, and non tribal lands, because of our um, our original geographical historical areas, including Tucson, Arizona, Phoenix, Arizona, and everywhere far and in between. Um, they continued to develop. And even though there are laws sometimes that they don't really consider some of those things to protect them and so forth. But best practices in order to preserve, not only for the sake of, of, of we would wonder for us as the original inhabitants of the area, whether that's the Tohono, maybe the Apache, the Navajo, the Wallapais, or wherever, whatever tribe, whatever tribe or, or group of people that live in that area, rather than destroying that, preserving it. And I appreciate, we appreciate times when we're called to certain areas to, to look uh, from archeologists and so we discover things. I always remember the footprints in Tucson, Arizona. I'm not sure if you're aware of those, um, dating back thousands of years old. And when we went over there, I said to my son, see, our stories are true. Our, what they call folk tales, our fairy tales, our stories that people think are legends that are not real, they are real because this is what they talk about. And that's why we have to preserve and protect. It's okay to discover, it's okay to, to build, but do it in the right way. And so when we start talking about archaeological and um, findings and disturbing disturbance of areas. We got to think about those people because we're going into other people's homes and disturbing it. It was as if I was to go into your home and start moving things all over the place. Maybe somewhere where you have your family photos or whatever, or maybe a loved one that has passed on or something very sacred to you. I go there, get it, and destroy it, or start moving things around where you don't like it, you wouldn't like me to do that. Maybe if I asked you and said, hey, I'd like to come into your house and rearrange it, can I do that? You would tell me, no, this is not your house. But that's what happens on the outside, that's what happens. That's what happens to a lot of the areas. So we have, we've been confined to these small things called reservations. They put us on these small areas of land. In 1874, they created the Santa Maria Reservation. 
And then in 1882, the Gila Bend Reservation. In 1917, and the uh, Sells Reservation, 78 Florence, and at the Hetchland and the West Valley, and then kind of all piecemeal what we have today together. And that's where about 2.8 million acres small. And we say 2.8 million acres small, it's because of what I mentioned before about our lands extending way beyond the geographical boundaries now of the Tonal Nation. And we believe, and it is stated in our constitution of Tonal Nation, that our jurisdiction goes beyond the geographical boundaries of the Tonal Nation because our people are abroad. Um, not that we have fiscal jurisdiction and to not adhere to laws in another country or in the state or, or elsewhere. Um, so we got to live with those those things and in, in these times. And I appreciate so to try to at least give an understanding if you didn't already know about some of these things. But going back to what we talked about um, in the video in January 25th of 2017, something happened. Uh, a certain president issued executive order 1376. Seven, that declared for construction of a physical wall on the southern border with Mexico. There, as you saw in the video and was stated, many significant areas of cultural, historical importance were disrupted. We weren't disrupted, we're devastated, we're, we're blown up. Cemeteries, watersheds were drained to keep a promise to build a wall. And I can tell you right now that it was a pretty sad day in the beginning and elders will tell you and people will tell you, young people will tell you that even just to look there right now is such a sad sight because it is like I explained to people when they ask me, how did that make you feel? What did, what did that do to you? I said, it's unexplainable. But I only can imagine if someone got a knife and dragged it across my heart and that's the least I could explain and how it feels to me. But that started way back with the Gaston Purchase in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And we faced with all these. And now what we want to do is preserve and protect what we have here. And that's why it's so important that we learn about each other's cultures. We learn about each other's history, because rather than destroying it, maybe we could preserve it. Maybe not for me, maybe not for you, but the generations that are here and the generations to come. We don't even know how much time we have left here in this world. At the rate we're going nowadays, I don't think we have that much time. It's the way we're destroying Mother Nature. And today I was out on the range at our ranch and we're looking at wells and water holes and water encatchments and we're talking about the land and I was sharing about some of the archaeological sites in the area and they said, well, these, are, these, aren't, these aren't recorded. I said, I know they're not. And they're not gonna be recorded. We know about these things and we hold this dear to us. But trust me, believe in me, 
that they are. I might not have a title that says I am the authority that makes a decision or whatever on this, or I might not have a, a degree that tells you that I know what I'm talking about, but I can tell you that I know that they're there. And so we help each other as we learn from each other. No matter what area that you go into, whether that's in Arizona or another state, whether that's with the Tohono tribe or a tribe on the East Coast, the West Coast, on the northernmost border, and everywhere in between, in, in Mexico and in Canada, because we're destroying lives, we're destroying history. And you went like that if we walked into your closets to, to destroy your family heirlooms, your family uh, uh, photo album books or, or notes and letters or whatever um, writings of your family. You wouldn't like that. I was just in Mexico where I was taken to some graves that were uh, destroyed by making up a road. And the graves were the rocks were scattered all over and some of the locals were starting to gather them, pile them back up on the graves. You could see that were sunken in and that they parked heavy equipment on top of them. Not either they didn't they they didn't know or they didn't care. And when we went there it was a pretty sad feeling. Just like when we go to these other sacred areas that are destroyed, have been destroyed. And we give thanks to a lot of the people that are within these areas of study. They try to do things the right way. Um, I do want to thank people that have come to us and have asked for permission uh, to come to some of these archeological sites and historical sites and have reached out to local folks to help educate others on these things because they're helping tell the narrative of those sacred sites to a degree that we're able to. I'm not able to share a lot of things with you um, that I am held to, to keep protected, but I can share with you some of the things that I, that I have been told that we can't share with um, the public or a general audience. But there are many things such as uh, that already have been exploited or disturbed, and such as uh, the Piñacates in, in, in Sonora, Mexico, uh, home of our creator, Itoy. Um, you know, the Itoyki in Babakiri Mountains, uh, Ventana Cave, uh, Children's Shrine, which is no longer open to the public. And many other areas far and in between. Um, and a lot that I have not been, a lot that have not been uh, even uh, documented or, 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 or known about. And that I rather, as one elder said, I don't want to say anything because if I tell people that about these areas and then people will want to go there and people will want to know more about it. And then it will be destroyed and then it will be no longer a sacred area. And so I respected that. I respected that and what he told me on that. So every stick and stone is sacred. Every plant is sacred. Every animal is sacred. And the non autumn the non-Indigenous people say, you guys always say that everything's always sacred, blah, blah, blah. blah. And it is. It is. I can't help it if your people and your teachings didn't teach it this way. I can't help it if you come from another culture where it's not sacred. But everything has its purpose. 
one of the reasons why we don't live in harmony anymore and there's so much destruction and there's so much abuse and so much uh, self-destruction is because we forget about some of those common teachings. And we're destroying societies. They've tried to destroy, destroy indigenous people from the beginning of the first European contact. But like I said, you know, um, the doctrine of discovery I gave us talk about one time. <laughs> and um, to a bunch of faith based groups. At the end of the discussion, everybody was apologizing to me. I said, don't apologize to me. Don't apologize to me. If you're truly sympathetic and you want to be, you want to give a true apology, start today. Start today and this day forward. Remember what I said. Because the doctrine of discovery is still valid law and been recognized by the U.S. Supreme Court. And the doctrine of discovery, what did it say? Go out there and find new lands and if they're not Christian, destroy them and take their land from them. Still good law today. Our lands are still being destroyed today. The American government also had a similar manifest destiny. Kill the Indian, save the man. Go out there and take this. And with that, take all their property too. We don't own that. We live on trust land. We are dependents of the federal government. And even though there are federal laws that are supposed to be are there to protect us, they usually not, especially when it's the federal government that's doing the destruction. But hopefully by us sharing some of these things, those of you that go into this type of work or are interested and concerned about the, you'll help us preserve and protect those sacred sites, those archeological sites that need to be protected. It is a job that is bigger than the Thornhaw Automation. It is an issue as a subject matter that a lot of indigenous people can relate to. And it's happened not only here, it's happened across the world. All in the name of development, all in the name of furthering someone's agenda in order to live in harmony the way they think it should be. But what about us? What about the original people? I mean, I like to get in, I'd rather get in a car and drive 60 miles to Tucson, then walk or ride a horse because it'll take me forever. I'm guilty as charged, you know? But how do we do these things? We still got to preserve and protect some areas. We still got to, uh, I like hopefully that we could do more solar than, you know, and use natural energies and so forth like that. But we don't have the money to pay for a lot of those things. And that's what we're talking in the Ranch right now. We're instead of running the old Jensen Jack uh, pumps, we're running solar pumps now. Small things we're inching forward. Um, I want to take. A, I mean, that's it's. I want to take a break and see um, if the host that's gonna, if there are any questions, uh, I will try to answer. Uh, I don't know everything, but if not, I'll try to guide you to where the answer might be, or I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm open for a few questions if there are any at this time.
Thank you, Mr. Berlin. Uh, really enjoying your talk. So I definitely got to reach out to you. Have a lot of questions myself. <laughs> uh, we have a few questions here on the Q&A and on our chat. And I'll start with the first one that came in. And it said, it reads, could the pronunciation for Hia Seed Autumn be clarified? I hope I said that correctly. Or as close. <laughs> uh, so it's the pronunciation. Berlin, you're oh. muted. Okay, I'm wondering if that was from the video on the on the Ah, it's like not. The, but if it was, if it's starting with the Q, I'm wondering if it's Quito Bequito. Quito Bequito, um, it's the natural spring along the border. Um, in our language, it's called Arawaipia. Arawaipia. Arawaipia is a uh, small springs because there's a number of natural springs that are in that area, baby springs or small springs. Um, but when people came that couldn't pronounce it, like our Ardoipia, somehow it got translated to Quito Bequito. <laughs> just like many, many names, um, just like Tucson and Arizona, our original author name, a lot of the, the cities and towns in Mexico originally autumn community and when the Europeans or the Spanish came in they named them something similar to that so Quito Bequito um the, it's the I guess the English Spanish name for it uh the autumn name is Arla Huayte Small Springs okay thank you and you have <laughs> one Another question, and it's, uh, has Quito Baquito recovered its water level any since the wall construction stopped? Um, yeah, we, we have been informed that, um, we have been informed that uh, the water levels have risen um, a little bit, they've come up. Um, they're still concerning. Um, they're still concerning to to us, but since a lot of the water pumping has, has stopped, I think there's been some. Uh, they 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 the national park and other people that check on it see it not decreasing. I think it's a good thing. Yeah. Okay. And. Third question, have there been openings on the border on the reservation so that people can now cross? Is any work now being done to restore any of the damage? Okay. Um, <laughs> so the Tohono O'odham Nation, the, as I mentioned, um, we're on the reservation now. The Donald Mason's southernmost boundary uh, on the international border is 62 miles. 62 miles is the Crow Five, from the Barbecue Mountain Range to the Alpha Mountain Range. In that is the Donald the Mason, 62 give or take. There is no wall. There is no human barrier. To the west, the Ajo Mountains past Lukeville, Sonoida, all the way to California, um, there is a human wall. There is a wall, as you saw in the video. Um, to the east, the Babakiri Mountains on the other side of the mountains to Sasabi and Iraq up that way, there is, towards Nogales, there is a wall. But on the Tonot, the Mason is 62 miles international boundary, there is no wall. The only thing that is there is a vehicle barrier. A vehicle barrier that was approved 
by the local folks, the local communities, the districts, and the Thon Hall Nation. And there are three traditional crossings there within that 62 miles that only the Tohono O'odham can use to go back and forth to Mexico. And when we started that, the vehicle barrier, the elders said, yes, because a lot of the vehicles were getting stolen in the U.S. taken to Mexico. Yes, it's becoming an issue. Yes, they're stealing our own vehicles. But we cannot stop the migration of animals. Remember, we have a responsibility for animals. So those vehicle barriers had to be environmental friendly. They had to be able to allow animals to migrate. I'm not talking about domestic animals. I'm not talking about horses and cows. We're talking about the deer, the javelina, the jaguars, all those uh, wildlife that, that know no boundaries. And so that's what you'll find on the Tohono O'odham Nation are vehicle barriers with three traditional crossings only for the Tohono O'odham to use to go back and forth. So there is no 30 foot wall on that 62 miles. Okay, thank you. I, um, real, real quick, I, I, on the question that was asked early on, I was wondering if there were wanting to Kichibukito or Hiachit, that was the other word that came yeah. up in there. Hiachit. Yeah, that one's it, yeah. <laughs> okay, Hiachit, okay. Hiachit, Hiachit Autumn. Uh, they refer to them, maybe that term would be like the, the sand papagos, uh, the, the autumn that kind of uh, were in that region. Um, that was kind of their area because they were in, in, in Mexico, um, where the um, Piñacates and along what people know as Rocky Point, Puerto Pinasco, all the sand back there and so forth, and just all the way north. Um, so they were kind of called the Hiachit Autumn, the people of the sand. Yeah, that's what it was. Hiachit. Okay. They come from the sand. Yeah. Thank you. They kind of call themselves sand people. Okay, you have another question. Um, have Arizona Senators Kelly or Cinema spoken to you about what your nation needs to recover and heal from border wall construction? Um, I'm not involved in the government as much as I was before, since 2019. Uh, June of 2019. Um, if you're asking me personally, no. <laughs> um, I think that once they got in office, uh, just like just like anything else, they were hit with a million and one different things. Uh, the wall being one of them, um, but. The other thing is that how much have we as the Hon Autumn been involved in trying to heal? The Healing the Border group was not only the Hon Autumn members, there were non Thon Autumn members that were on this group. Um, and when we talked about that, we talked about if we're going to stop the wall, well, we need to heal first. And we need to heal, we need to start with ourselves as individuals, what do we want and why do we want it? And we need to pray for healing. And when we talked about healing, you know, healing the border, it meant even praying for those people that were constructing the wall. Because what I said is that those people that are constructing the wall, they're probably not bad people, but that's a job. They're, they need to put bread on their table. But the people that are authorizing that, we need to pray for them too, because they need to heal. For they know not what they do. But we are the ones who are suffering from it. So to answer that question, not to the best of my knowledge, uh, have that conversation had 
if they had, it would have eventually come down to us as the reports go, but maybe I missed the meeting when they said they did, but no, the answer to my response would be no, not to the best of my knowledge. Okay, and you have two more. One, uh, could you speak to the significance of Babukiri Mountain, the sacredness and energy it looms over the landscape? Babakiri Mountain, Wawagiwa. Wawagiwa, um, wow, wow, in our language, Wawagiwa, wow is like a cliff, like a sheer rock, like a, a cliff, the end of a mountain that's just sheer rock down. Wow, wow. Giwa, Giwa is like, um, I don't know, maybe your seat belt or maybe your belt, something that you tighten, you tighten real tight. Um, and some say that the landscape used to be a lot different a long time ago. Um, in, in some interpretations, I heard it, I seen it, they talked it from, from when they talked to elders and so forth, they, they referred to it as a constricted rock meaning that it was like tight. At some point it came, like it was almost like it was tight together. But the autumn called it Wawagiwa. And of course you couldn't, they couldn't translate it and you know, where the heck Baba Kirby came from, but <laughs> that meant Baba Kirby. Um, the sacredness of that mound is where one of the places where our elder brother, one of our co-creators, Itoi, uh, the person that we called upon when we needed to. Um, I, I explained Itoi as probably like, uh, I don't want to offend anybody's religion or anything like that, but um, he wasn't like God, but he was a man, he was a person with special powers and knowledge and could do different things. Um, and I don't know if I'm I'm getting this right, but now I, I'm hesitant to say it, but I'll say it anyway, because I'm used to putting my foot in my mouth. <laughs> Ether was like, maybe someone like Jesus. My mother's probably gonna hate me for reason. But <laughs> it was a man, a person that came to teach us all these things and whatnot and could do certain things. And whatnot. And so every time the people needed him, they would call upon Ito to come. And they say that that was one of his homes. And people um, today uh, is very protected and, and there's a lot of good positive energy around there. Um, things happen there that are unexplainable. Um, it, it, it's, it's a lot of good, good vibes around there. I hear some people talk about Sedona that they go to Sedona and there's all this nat good natural positive energy on there. Well, we feel the same way about Bobby Kirby. We feel the same way about the Pinacates. We feel the same way about other areas. Um, but that's the significance of Bobby Kirby, Bobby Kirari, Wawa uh, because that's some, like some, everybody has like the center of their universe um, where they believe all that natural energy comes from. But in, in reality, um, our center of our universe probably should be in the Piñacates in Sonora, Mexico, where we were brought up from underneath the ground. But anyway, I think that's uh, cultural significant and uh, about Bob Kirby. Thank you. One of the other things about uh, Bob Kirby, um, it, it's one of the highest points in the area. And we as um, Autumn, we've always looked for the peak as a guide to home, to come home. As a guide, when I used to fly, do a lot of flying, and I would fly from Phoenix to Tucson, um, whether I was coming from Washington, D.C. or anywhere else, and if it was during the day, uh, and I could see the Baba Kiri, peak of Baba Kiri, 
I felt I'm home. I've made it. This good feeling came about me. But years ago, and, it, and it's in a lot of our songs and our story, because people talk about, I was walking, I was going, and I could see Bobby Kirby peak, you know, in the, in the foreground. I knew I was getting close to home. So it was kind of a, a central point for, for direction as well. Yeah. Glad to mention that. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Could you please? I'm not sure this last one, um, last question here is asking, do you have anything more to share about time being here? Are there other time markers of different people that you can share about? I'm not sure I understand the question. Can you repeat it one more time? As Mr. Jose spoke about the often people and their descendants being present for time and memorial, do you have anything more to share about the time being here? Are there other time markers of different people that you can share about? Um, okay. We've been here since time and memorial, at least from our oral traditions and, and stories. Um, we have... Uh, from first European contact. Um, and when they, when they arrived from the East, when they arrived from the South, um, and I talked a little bit about uh, mm -hmm. the doctrine of discovery. I talked about, you know, when Father Kino came, why well, didn't talk about it, but Father Kino, when he came to the area, um, and again, um, you know, Christianity was uh, was put upon us, and we it's like we almost didn't say no, but we were open. We were very hospitable people. Um, but as as uh, as my son would say, well, we accept it. We we accept it. We 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 accepted Christianity. We accepted Catholicism, and then. We fought against, we rebelled against Christianity. We accepted again, and then we burned down the churches. Then we accepted it again. And now 90, 80% of us are Catholics. Um, in a sense that that's kind of really what happened. Um, we, we, we accept it and there's a lot of good and not good uh, stories or, and facts about that. I'm working on a project with a young man from Mexico right now that discovered a lot of historical documents in some of the towns that originally were autumn communities. Um, going back to, I think there was some stuff from 1400, 1400, 1600, somewhere back in there, there were some documents and um, he was saying that uh, it's almost, you have to learn to read and how they wrote back then. Um, but it talks about the, the Papagos. It talks about the Papagos, it talks about the Apache, um, and all these different things. And there's some stuff that are, are not too good. And I told him, I said, you know what? You're going, this project, you're probably going to rewrite history <laughs> because everything that they wanted us to know about history, they told us. Everything they didn't want us to know about history, they didn't tell us. And now you've stumbled upon some of these things. But that's the same way, the same way in America. It's the same way in America um, as European contact. Um, they only tell you what they want to tell you about history. They don't tell you about how history actually was or is. Um, they teach us history in modern day schools and so forth, but they never tell you everything. They only tell you what they want to. So in other, I'm not sure if that's what you mean by um, time being by other time markers of different people. But yes, we have those. We have those and through our calendar sticks and through um, the uh, um, 
do the uh, rock art. Um, um, some of these things are, are, are told in that way um, when things came upon us. So the, uh, the ancient people and the, the Hulgum and um, those times, they, they left, um, they, they left um, certain indications of what was happening back then. And we only need to learn to know, and we don't even know if we are deciphering or we're reading it properly, but we think we know this is what they were trying to say because we weren't then, we weren't there then. And there's nothing that says, this is how you read this. But through, again, just that relevance of nature and connection, we believe this is what they're telling us. Um, but we can't say uh, for sure, or, or, but we know that um, there's differences of people that came in our lives and whether the, whether the hoo hoo gum were really somebody totally different than us or whether they are really our ancestors, but we believe that they are our ancestors. So, but we know that there's a lot of, um, different cultural properties that tell us there's some connection, like the area I came from today. Um, an archeologist took me to this area and he said he wanted to show me something. And he took me to this area and he showed me some black glass-like looking rock. And he said, do you know what this is? I said, no. He said, it's obsidian. He said, obsidian is not from this area. This comes somewhere further south, way deep south. But why, how is it here? Well, I didn't tell him what I was told or what we're shared with about how historically years, years, hundreds of years that this was a major trade route and things like that. And people came through here. How and why do we have in burials and different things, uh, feathers of birds that didn't exist in this area. But we also got to remember that back in time, the, the, the earth, the area was different. And so maybe those birds did exist here or they didn't exist here, but we find a lot of those things. So I'm not sure uh, the evidence about different peoples and the markers um, I guess yes, there is. So, anyway. I think that's that's good. Thank you. I think the uh, last question that came in is the video you showed, which was very powerful. Is it available to show to others? Yes, um, it is available. I was sharing that we only recently the group um, several weeks ago, maybe three four weeks ago, maybe a month ago we made it public. We wanted to make sure that we took care of everything properly. Um, we closed that project correctly and we turned, because we had many, many hours of recording, um, but we only could, it was supposed to be a five minute video, but we squeezed 13 minutes out of it. And the rest of that we gave to the Thon Autumn Nation uh, Culture Center and Museum so they can have it for their, their records and what they choose to do with it or make it available is up to them, but the video, yes, is public now. Please feel free to share it. Annabelle, if I, I could comment on that too. Um, Berlin has allowed us to record this presentation tonight. So if we can get your consent to put that on our YouTube channel, the video will be complete on that channel as part of this video. Okay. Um, Real quick, I, I saw in the chat something about it mean to be confusing about evidence of people here 13,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, agriculture, et cetera, et cetera. I mentioned about the, the footprints in, in Tucson. They're building a freeway. We got called there and there were footprints that were there of what, what the, Anthropologists and archaeologists deemed were 
with an adult, uh, I think in a child, and a dog, <laughs> a puppet of a dog, Paul. And I think they were dated about 4,000 some years or so. Um, but they were, they were found when they were, when they were doing their um, surveys for, for the project that they were gonna do there. Um, and they made casts of them and so forth. And my understanding that people from around the world actually came to, to look at that area. Um, but we as a Tonatum nation, even though it's not on the nation, we were contacted and we were giving the opportunity to be there and do our ceremonies there and so forth. So um, I just kind of saw that in the chat that uh, yeah, there is markers. There's plenty of markers all over Tucson, all over Phoenix, all over the geographical areas that I mentioned. Um, they're there. And one of the things, and is, is that it? Because there are some final thoughts I wanted to close with. Yeah, I think that's the last question we had. So we can leave it to you. Turn okay, thank you again. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. I kind of jumped all over the place. There was so much stuff I want to share, um, but trying to hit different high points and I thought that the video was, it is still valid uh, concerns to us today and I'm sure will be. But when we start to look at geographical areas away from the border, it's still the same thing. You know, you destroy the area, uh, you ignore the, the, the existing laws or, or even the best practices, you are violating somebody else's livelihood or society. One of the things that we as Tahana Atom do is, um, and we still practice today, one of our main ceremonies um, where it's been done, evidence says it's been done for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, and we're still pretty much involved in. And it's not open to the public. It's not open to non autumn um, unless you're invited. Um, or you're allowed to be there by the elders or the ceremony leaders. We're told that we need to continue that uh, ceremony in order for the world to be in balance. In order for, for us to live in harmony, in order for our people to be well, in order for us to have a good harvest, good crops, in order for the rains to come to water Mother Earth, in order for us to have a good hunt in the winter time, we need to do the ceremony that was given to us by the creator, that was given to us by each life who told us we have to do this. Most of y'all probably just got through celebrating your new year, had parties and whatnot, blah, blah, blah. Happy new year. Autumn, our new year is the beginning of summer. The beginning of summer when we start to harvest all the traditional foods, all the traditional foods that we start to harvest and start to store, we start to get ready to plant our crops for the summer rains. We do our dances and our singing in the hottest time of the year. We dance with all our regalia on when it's 115 degrees and we're weathering we're wearing blankets and leather and bells and shells and all these different things and we're running and dancing in order to keep the world in balance. We do this not for ourselves, but we do this for the world because that's what we're told we need to do. And I know or I believe that there are other societies across this world that are doing their own ceremonies. And I, as the saying goes that where I stand here today, there's someone on the other side of this world praying for you and I. And like that, we pray for them too. So we'll continue to sing our songs and dance our dance. We'll continue to, to preserve and practice our culture and our ceremonies. And we'll continue to raise arms about protecting 
It's land. And we ask that you respect it as well, too. If not join us, at least respect that in that way. Thank you for giving me some time. Um, I did say we could share my name and my, my number. I'd be happy to speak to you if I can, if you can catch me. <laughs> um, drop me a line or whatever, but uh, I'd rather that we tell our own story. You wanna hear from someone or do you wanna read about it or hear about it in the six o'clock news? So anyway, Joshua Simhoiga, God bless each and every one of you. Thank you for your time. Ma, O Pueblo program, we all thanks. Thank, thank you on behalf of O Pueblo. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> we thank you, Verlin. That was amazing. I really learned a lot, and uh, I think we all learned a lot. So thank you again, and to everybody who's watching out there. You know, continue to donate or make donations to help support. We're probably going to go virtual, and. Uh, Stay safe and mask up. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce.